Hi there, everybody. Thanks for joining us for our Safety and Health Magazine webcast today, sponsored by Bulwark. We are going to give everyone just about two minutes to get settled in today, and we'll start our presentation in approximately two minutes. Thanks to you all for joining us today. We will get started in approximately one minute with today's webcast. Thank you. Hello everyone and welcome to today's Safety and Health webcast, Coronavirus Practical Guide for Those Who Power Our World, FRAR Clothing and FR Cloth Face Coverings, sponsored by Bulwark. My name is Barry Botino and I am an Associate Editor at Safety and Health Magazine. I'll be moderating today's event. We would like to thank you all for joining us and be on behalf of the National Safety Council, we hope that you're all remaining safe and healthy during the COVID-19 pandemic. First things first, I have a few housekeeping items to share with you at this time. As a disclaimer, the views of today's speakers and organization are their own and do not necessarily reflect those of the National Safety Council or Safety and Health Magazine. Any mention of a commercial enterprise, product, or publication does not mean the council or the magazine endorses those items. After today's presentation, we will conduct a question and answer session with our speaker. To ask a question, just click the Q&A button located at the bottom of your screen, type in your question, and press the Send button. You may ask your question at any time at all during today's presentation. You do not have to wait for the Q&A to begin. We'll try to answer as many questions as possible but we might not get to every question. The good news is that any unanswered questions today will be forwarded along to our speaker. After this presentation, you'll be asked to complete a brief evaluation survey, but I'll tell you a little bit more about that later. This webcast will be archived, so you can access it after today's live event. To view this webcast and all of our past webcasts, please go to safetyandhealthmagazine.com slash events or you can also receive a link in our post-event email. With that, let's introduce our presenter. We're very pleased today to have with us Derek Sang, who serves as the Technical Training Manager at Bulwark Protection and is an expert in FRAR clothing. For more than 25 years, Derek has been involved in the industry in a variety of roles, including the service, manufacturing, and garment sides of the business. Derek also stands above the crowd as an educator and as a speaker. He's developed more than 250 informational and educational seminars for audiences around the globe. Derek has also served as a keynote speaker on the hazards of arc flash and flash fire, along with numerous other safety topics. Again, folks, we thank you all for tuning into this presentation. And Derek, whenever you're ready, go ahead and take it away. Barry, as always, Thank you for that kind introduction. And uh, for everyone uh, listening to us live or archived, uh, morning, noon, evening, wherever and whenever, thank you so much for taking your valuable time to learn a little bit more about uh, coronavirus and kind of how it's affected uh, the folks that uh, 
utilize our clothing as PPE. So with that, let's get started. Let's get the attorneys out of the way. Presentation is for informational purposes only. Customers of Bulwark Protective Brands are solely responsible for conducting their own hazard risk assessment to identify safety hazards in their work environment. Customers of Bulwark Protective Brands are solely responsible for selecting appropriate garments and protective gear for their employees and ensuring wearers use the garments and protective gear properly and in conjunction with appropriate gloves and footwear. Because working conditions and other factors may vary, Bulwark Protective Plan does not make any representation that these garments and protective gear will protect wearers from injury. So on to the good stuff. Uh, as the title suggested, this is really a practical layperson's guide to uh, what we've encountered over, gosh, over the last year now and, and how that's affected our essential workers in uh, oil and gas, refineries, utilities, et cetera, areas to where prior to this, uh, our clothing was essential for uh, protecting against short duration thermal events. And then we throw this virus in here, this pandemic, and we have people who still have to keep the lights on, keep the energy machine going, and what are they encountering? So we got a lot of questions in and around flame resistant arc rated clothing and what to do uh, concerning COVID-19. So in our brief time together, uh, we'll cover some of the SARS basics. It's almost a little difficult now because I think everybody is familiar with that little spiky ball and all the things that uh, go along with it. We'll talk about neutralizing uh, the virus as it pertains to taking care of your clothing and your equipment. What are some best practices? And again, this has been a moving target from when we started uh, a year ago to where we are now, it's almost, uh, it was almost on an hourly basis, a daily basis, a monthly basis. And thankfully now we're kind of slowing down as far as what we need to know and what we do know. And the information is getting more consistent and more accurate. But we'll talk about what are some of the best practices we've learned in this time frame. And then we'll look into that cloth face covering, AKA what's being regularly known, even though incorrectly as a mask, but we'll talk about FR cloth face coverings and what you need to know there in order to protect yourself if you're required to wear those and uh, some thoughts in and around keeping that going. So a few definitions, first and foremost, uh, severe acute respiratory syndrome, coronavirus 2, SARS-CoV-2 is the virus. COVID-19, that's the disease that it causes. Uh, flame resistant, that just means that it puts itself out, that the fabric ultimately uh, in garment form uh, will not support combustion, does not melt, drip, and add to the injury. FRAR, you'll hear me use that a lot. Uh, that's flame resistant and arc rated. Flame resistant first, why? Because all arc rated garments by default are flame resistant, not all flame resistant garments that go through the additional testing to become arc rated. FRCFC is the flame resistant version of the cloth face covering that we're all uh, familiar with. And as again, it is not a mask and or face protection. It's not designed to replace masks in and off when they're needed, or is it designed to be uh, face protection? It is just utilizing fabrics that we already know will not melt, drip, and add to the injury because the last thing you want to do is take one of those disposable, aka flammable, meltable little masks and have you wearing that in an environment where you are potentially exposed to short-duration thermal events. We'll discuss cleaning. What is cleaning? That refers to the removal of germs, dirt, and impurities from surface. It does not kill germs. We're just removing it. Disinfecting. That's where we're utilizing chemicals or ultraviolet light to kill germs on surfaces. The process does not necessarily clean the surfaces. Why are we talking about both? Because you're gonna to have to be aware of both because you, your PPE is made up of different materials that have to be cleaned and disinfected somewhat differently. So I did my best to include links to what we're talking about, but what is coronaviruses? First and foremost, we're all well aware by now, viruses, unlike bacteria, are not alive. Viruses are infectious agents, not living organisms. They can only multiply in living cells. 
uh, novel coronavirus, we had no immunity early on. That's why there was so alarming. Again, not a bacteria, not a single cell organism. It has to hijack a living organism in order to replicate itself and how it does that and how it transfers to us as what we're looking to uh, disconnect from so that we don't get infected. So how does it infect a cell? Uh, again, in the simplest, most uh, basal level, uh, it has unique features to where it can do this very, very well. Uh, it likes to get into obviously our respiratory tract, it likes to get into our nasal passages, in through our mouth, into our lungs, uh, where it can begin the infection process. The outer spike protein of the coronavirus latches onto specific uh, receptors on the surface of cells in the respiratory tract. And these binding triggers the process where the virus fuses onto human cells and creates that process of alerting our autoimmune system autoimmune system starts overreacting and hence we have this very uh, reaction to it. So what do we know today uh, where we are about transmission? Contact transmission, droplet transmission, and airborne transmission. Uh, direct contact with an infectious person touching during a handshake or article or surface has become contaminated, uh, sometimes called fomite tra transmission. We are learning more and more that that's not as uh, formidable a uh, way of transferring as first thought. Uh, we're actually seeing a CDC now backing off on some of its uh, cleaning requirements because they're finding that contact transmission is not as uh, easy as once perceived to be. Droplet transmission is the big one. That's the one where everything in and around why we're even considering the utilizing of cloth face coverings is come to it. The six foot uh, of distancing, social distancing for normal communication. Obviously, there's been lots of communication along, uh, you know, yelling, shouting, singing. Any of those are going to increase the necessary socialized distance because we're pushing those droplets out at a further rate. So again, that's where we got into my mask protects you, your mask protects me, together we protect each other. Why we're looking to knock those droplets down uh, or have them not enter into that communal uh, airspace. Airborne transmission, uh, that's exposure to those virus containing uh, respiratory droplets comprise of smaller droplets that can typically stay in the air Again, there's been some studies done, more information to come on that, but the big one seems to be the middle where we're looking at the droplet transmission. So what do we know about that transmission? Again, the epidemiology has been pretty sufficient now. When we were first doing this webinar going back six uh, months or so, this was uh, much more communicated in the sense that understanding how, but we're pretty familiar with what it takes to become infected. Spending a significant period of time in and around infected people in close proximity seems to be pretty uh, cut and dry right now. With that being said, though, even way back early on, and I think a lot of people on this call may have seen the video. If not, you can go to YouTube. It's still accessible. And the reason uh, Wheel Cornell Medical Center was important to us is uh, our, one of our consultants in uh, our burn injury works in the burn uh, center here, Wheel Cornell. Uh, she actually uh, knows of Dr. Price. They provide a lot of the uh, burn uh, data for us. Think uh, FDNY. Uh, when you think of where this is located right in the heart of New York City there. And at that time, when this was coming out, that was the epicenter for, uh, for COVID at the time in this country. And Dr. Price came out and he actually created the video for his family members to kind of put them at ease. And the term he said is, look, if we do certain things, COVID is pretty wimpy as, as viruses go. 
in a reasonable period of time, it dries out and becomes inactive. Disinfectants, bleach, alcohol destroy the, the virus. Soap and water is highly effective. And that has nothing to minimize the severity of what it has done uh, over the time period that it's been there. But other than to say, if we do basic things, uh, the virus in and of itself is not that uh, durable. So who is this or what is this and why can we uh, take care of it? is because it's made up of pretty simple things that if we do certain things and correct orders at certain times and places, we can mitigate uh, the spread of this virus. It's, you've seen the spiky protein that attaches to everything and helps anchor it uh, to the living cells in order to replicate itself. That lipid membrane is key in once it melds with that living cell to allow that genetic material that's on the inside to do all the nasty stuff. But what makes it successful as a virus is also its Achilles heel, which allows us to go out and uh, neutralize it. And the easiest way to do it, and people may ask why is uh, washing your hands in soap and uh, warm water so effective is because of the soap molecule and how it works. So you have a hydrophilic head which bonds with water. You have a hydrophobic tail which avoids water and bonds with oil and fat. And as you remember, that virus is a big fatty membrane. So you're gonna have the soap going out with these tails that want to find the fat, and then the hydrophobic head that's going to bond with the water. And what ends up happening is these soap molecules end up, for all basic definition, they start vibrating and moving and start breaking apart uh, the virus. And once its uh, insides are removed, it's basically neutralized. It then wraps around it and it's washed away in, uh, and disposed of. So as more and more people are being impacted by this, the question of how to properly home wash FR garments obviously came to the service. We had our essential workers, those that were producing uh, the energy materials like oil and gas and, and, and others. And then we had folks on our utility side who were keeping the lights on. We had our general industry electricians keeping the widget seams, uh, machines moving so that we could uh, load trucks and get to grocery stores and keep all that infrastructure moving. And these folks were wearing uh, flame-resistant arc-rated clothing and needed to know how to take care of it. And the good news was following the basic guidelines already uh, suggested by the manufacturers was more than sufficient to take care of potentially uh, infected fabrics and uh, garments. Now, what did we learn along the way uh, when it came to chlorine? What we had was folks who now had to uh, disinfect and take care of their equipment. And what the CDC recommended was, hey, if you take one third cup of chlorine bleach and you dilute it in a gallon of water and utilize that to spray down your equipment, you are going to sanitize your equipment from the virus. So we had folks who we had told for eons do not get chlorine and do not get peroxide and do not get these things anywhere near your flame resistant arc rated clothing. But like anything else in, in times of stress and times of distress, we had to go a little bit further and say, okay, can we separate the flame resistant arc rated clothing all the time from the disinfecting process? And the answer was no. So we needed to give out some information. So what we had folks do, and our uh, colleagues at Tyndale did a great job of providing some of this, this information. They did a lot of work on it. In fact, the information I'll share with you comes directly from them. That is their uh, link to a lot of their information. And they even upped the ante a little bit, and they went to two-thirds a cup of chlorine bleach 
per gallon of water. And they actually went back to the basics and tested how would it affect the FR properties of fabrics utilized in garments today if things happened when folks were trying to clean and disinfect equipment utilizing chlorine bleach. What we found is it took a significant amount over a significant time to go beyond or cause something to fail. In fact, in their testing where you had your control subject, which we would expect to self-extinguish, we went to a small spill, one pump, three pumps, and soap fabrics, and we tested them for FR properties. What was found is that all of these situationals were passed. And remember, this is basically double what the CDC required for their one third of cup to a gallon. This was two thirds of cup to gallon, and we still could not get the fabrics to fail. So you had the vertical flame test, which is the baseline test for FR properties. If you're not familiar with that, you take a swatch of fabric, you hold it over an open flame in a test cabinet uh, for 12 seconds. The flame is then extinguished and the garment has, the fabric has to put itself out and the char lengths have to be under six inches for this. And all of these situations end up passing so they would be considered to still have their FR properties. So the good news was for all those essential workers who were tasked with uh, cleaning their equipment and dealing with their flame resistant arc rated clothing, incidental exposure to chlorine bleach was not going to affect their clothing over the short term. Now, that all being said, we still want to stick to the absolute basics. We don't want to expose our flame resistant arc rated clothing to chlorine peroxide and fabric softeners, et cetera, uh, because over the length of, or the duration of that wear cycle, it will not be ideal for the clothing, but in the short duration, accidental exposures, we found that we were not mitigating or doing anything to the FR engineering. What do we still want to do is think outside the box. For example, if I have to clean or wash down my equipment, I'm going to get out of my flame-resistant arc-rated clothing if it's possible. If I'm back at the yard, for example, as a utility worker, there is no arc flash hazard. I'm not in, in the arc flash boundary. I'm not in the mat. I'm cleaning my gear. Get into normal work clothes. Get out of your expensive flame-resistant arc-rated clothing and clean your equipment. If you have an old coverall, put that over top of uh, your current flame-resistant arc rated clothing if you're going to do it that way. If you want to throw on a disposable uh, coverall while cleaning, that's fine too. Now, for our folks who are in the thermal uh, hazard area, they can't remove themselves from that, i.e. I'm in a refinery, I'm cleaning my equipment, we're gate-to-gate flame-resistant uh, and 2112 compliant, get into a disposable FR coverall. Get into that old uh, FR coverall that you may have a, a slight rip, tear, or something that you have traditionally retired before, but you're going to utilize to protect what's underneath uh, because you can't take it off because you're on site. We still would rather you do all those things. All we're telling you is during these times of stress, that incidental exposure, we have tested it and it's shown not to affect the FR engineering uh, for fabric. So again, just to reinform that the, the testing did show that all those fabrics under these exposures had all passed. So where does that take us in uh, for cloth face coverings? Most places today are starting to uh, maybe relax the rules a little bit. Uh, most organizations are still being pretty emphatic that, hey, you may be relaxing outside of the work area, but in the work area, we're still going to adhere to wearing masks, social distancing, and following the protocols. So that being said, 
when you have to introduce a cloth face covering that now has to have FR properties, what are some things that we need to look for? Well, the FR properties, the keyest thing is it's not gonna melt, drip, and add to the injury. In a short duration thermal event, it's going to self-extinguish. Uh, your mask more than likely will have an arc rating, even though that's not vital. Uh, it's going to take that arc rating from the fabric that's made from. Understand most folks today are utilizing shirt weight fabrics. That's the most common. So you're going to have, a, you may even see a labeling that the, the face mask is cat two. The face mask has eight calories, uh, an ATPV of 8.2 calories. That is because that is where it's coming from. The parent, that shirt fabric weight has those measurements. It's met those, but it is not vital for your face mask. Remember, the purpose of the face mask is not to contribute to any injury in and around the face because you're having to wear it. The key criteria is and only is that it puts itself out. But since it's coming from those shirt weight fabrics that are being commercially utilized, you may be seeing uh, some information. Uh, in addition, NFPA 2112 and ASTM 1506, at the time that uh, this uh, PowerPoint was made, were fast tracking some revisions. They were getting some updates into those standards to give some folks some guidelines. There are even some TIAs being produced into what to look for uh, for uh, FR cloth face, face coverings. Also, ASTM has recently, I believe I read last week, has actually passed some standards into uh, putting some measurements in and around flame resistant cloth face coverings, cloth face coverings in general, to give us as consumers of these items some guidelines and what to look for. So there's more information out there currently right now on where we are with cloth face coverings in general. Uh, the biggest thing to note, obviously, is these are not respirators. Uh, they are not masks. They are correctly and properly referenced to as cloth face coverings, even though we are probably using the term mask in its loosest format to where, but it's not providing any protection and it definitely is not acting or duplicating the functionality uh, of a respirator. For where it's being utilized in our key industries, things to look for is it's not replacing wearing a face shield. It's not replacing uh, or adding to any kind of protection when we're looking at putting on uh, arc flash hoods. It's definitely not replacing a balaclava or anything to do when we're looking at uh, CAT2 work in, in 70E. So non-FR and or FR cloth favor are not designed as face protection or to be PPE in general. We are taking away a meltable, we're taking away an ignitable, and we're replacing it with fabrics that are similar to what we're breathing through in the non-FR world. They're similar to what we are, but we have now FR engineering in there, so they will not ignite continue to burn and or melt drip and cause injury. Because the worst thing would be is with all that thermal energy with exposure to that arc flash or that flash fire is you have all this uh, flame resistant arc rated PPE on and now we're incurring injury in and around the nose, the eyes, the face, the mouth because we have accidentally or incorrectly adorned a disposable uh, face covering that has ignitable or meltable properties in it. So we're looking to remove that. And when you look at when this first came about and as the marketplace responded, I think we did a pretty good job of getting out quickly uh, face coverings that would not melt, drip, and add to the injury. So why cloth face coverings? I think we're all pretty well versed on why or what we should be using these for. It's uh, as we're speaking, as we're communicating, uh, as we're articulating anything, we are producing and introducing fluid droplets into our general facility. 
and cloth face coverings mitigate that. I mean, if you put any kind of barrier, even regardless of the filtration rate, you are going to knock some of these down. The other piece is, is when we first started introducing uh, cloth face coverings in general was touching something or being touched by something infectious or touching onto something and then transferring it to our, our uh, face, nose and mouth in particular. And if you remember early on, there was those YouTube videos where some test folks had taken a, either a chalk or a transferring su substance or even washable inks and they put it on their fingers and they showed you through time release and the video throughout the day how their face went from flesh tone to being covered in whatever the byproduct was on their hand over a 16 hour period, you could see how often we unconsciously touched our faces. So mitigating that by having a cloth face covering on there was the theory behind that. Reducing droplets inhaled, uh, reducing droplets exhaled and contributing them to the environment. Knocking the distance down, that uh, six foot four uh, general conversation was, hey, it, it's, we got to have a number. We're saying that six feet for most cases. And that's why when we looked at exercising or we looked at communal activity or even someone like myself who's used to speaking in public, if I was on stage and I was talking to the back of the room and the back of the room was 30 feet away, I'm definitely going to project, well, everybody's projection is gonna contain water drops. So knocking down how far those can travel was advantageous. And again, also, if we were looking at picking up infectious agents on things that we touched, reducing the amount of droplets uh, that go onto the surface. And I think objectively, we can look at all the informations out there and agree that even at the most baseline levels, if we put a barrier in front of something and that barrier had the ability to do these things, it would be advantageous. And that's kind of where we were looking at on those things. So how do you think of cloth face coverings in your hierarchy of controls? And this was kind of interesting because I've heard it expressed a couple of different ways. Uh, I don't know if, if some of this is, yeah, you can say there's some liberties taken here in, in their explanation. Is this truly in the hierarchy? But it does give you something to think about as far as when you're looking at these. Can you eliminate yourself being exposed to this? Well, if you can be by yourself and mitigate how much you go outside, mitigate who you interact with, know all your brands, can, can staying home be considered eliminating yourself from this virus? Possibly. Uh, can we substitute or have a lesser infectious agent? Not currently as this was written, but hey, that's kind of what vaccines are looking to do to where we're substituting that if you do pick this up, it's not going to be, uh, as severe, ideally, similar to uh, inoculations and vaccines in the past. We're not saying that you won't get sick. We're hoping that when you do, or if you get it, it's going to minimize how sick you could have gotten. So there might be an argument there for substitution. Engineering controls, we're hearing a lot about ventilation. We're hearing about filters. We're looking at uh, designing uh, workspaces now to where we're putting those types of engineering controls in there. Administrative controls, you could say that cloth face coverings fit in there. Social distancing uh, is an administrative control. And then from a true PPE standpoint, you're probably looking at an N95 respirator. One of the interesting uh, quotes that I did pick up as we were uh, going through kind of the early stages of this when we were getting uh, a lot of information on, like I said, almost a daily basis. This was from, and I'm paraphrasing here, this was Jonathan Klain, and at the time it was the Fulton School of Engineering at, at ASU, and he goes, if we had robots spewing hazardous toxic material from an opening at approximately five feet off the ground, and we couldn't stop the exhaust process, 
we'd likely want to put a cover filter converter or other physical control over these spewing openings. So I just thought it was an interesting take on uh, putting it into kind of a biomechanical uh, view on things. So flame resistant cloth face coverings, FRCFC, it was a challenge because trust me, none of us would have thought in January of 2020 that we would be having to try and solve or balance protecting our essential workers, providing something that had a filtration rate where, and breathability so that they could somehow comfortably utilize this on an extended basis, provide some structural integrity so when it, it, it got wet from uh, just breathing, it got into the elements or however, this was a challenge and I think it was a challenge early on and you've seen the evolution of uh, mass designs uh, over time. Some of them very, very creative, some of them very creative and not very uh, protective. I actually saw one that was made out of uh, macrame if you could imagine the giant holes in that. I think it was a cloth face covering uh, in the loosest of definitions. It definitely wasn't providing any protection, filtration, great breathability, probably pretty comfortable, uh, not great structural integrity. So there are challenges across building these products. What, uh, what do we know? Are these safe to breathe through? Uh, in full transparency, we don't know a lot of that. We can extrapolate a lot but we don't know because we're utilizing fabrics that honestly were not designed to be cut and sewn in, into masks per se. Uh, we do want you to wash all cloth face coverings. I don't care if they're FR, non-FR, or somewhere in between, between because why? All fabrics have dyes, finishing, sizing, et cetera, in them, and you definitely don't want to put a brand new direct to face out of the box, any textiles. Uh, I would highly recommend that whatever you buy, wherever you buy it, that you wash it at least once before you ever wear it. And that's regardless if it's a mask, a t-shirt, pants, whatever the case may be. So what confidence do we have as suppliers uh, that we're gonna be okay? Well, a couple of cool things in first and foremost, we have been utilizing flame resistant arc rated fabrics in and around the face and the breathing zone forever. Uh, your shirt, call every, I mean, that is close to the face. I mean, if I was wearing my gas monitor, it would be within my breathing zone, which would be in here. And we've had flame resistant arc rated fabrics there for eons. The other thing is, is when we look at shrouds, when we look at balaclavas, when we look at close to in and around the face, we've had those fabrics uh, being utilized uh, for shade, for additional protection when we're getting into energized equipment for when it's even cold outside and in, in the weather. And the other piece is, is we have cut and sewn these fabrics uh, and their SDS sheets do not require any uh, protection from breathing over. And we've been doing that for decades upon decades. So to say that we have a certain comfort level along with all our testing, whether it's ISO, whether it's Okiotex, we are very comfortable. But the caveat is, is we've never directly done it, but there's a lot of circumstantial evidence there to the whys and why not. We are, as a marketplace, most of the top providers are pretty transparent from their SDS sheets, talking about where and when and how they would be classified. They're readily available and should be readily available. Uh, there is, for example, on the fabric that we utilized, the fabric that we utilized was an 8812, which is the most, one of the most common fabrics utilized in flame resistant uh, arc rated clothing worldwide. And uh, even though there is trace amounts of formaldehyde uh, in the initial, that's why we say wash it because it goes down from like 700 to 300 parts per million in the initial washing. Uh, 
Okio text does not even recognize it as a, a notable as far as uh, reporting goes. California requirements don't recognize the levels of high enough as reporting to. In addition, from a cutting and sewing standpoint, where you think it would be most relevant on a day-to-day, hour-to-hour basis, there's no aspiration hazards or inhalation concerns. So at this time, this is some of the most up-to-date and best information we can give across what we're utilizing. Also, that guy may look uh, a little familiar, uh, looks somewhat like your speaker today. I took what we built and said, okay, fine, formal, where are we at? How could we take this and accelerate it through and see, can you breathe in this comfortably? Up until it got saturated uh, with sweat. So whether that was a rainy environment or in this case, it just happened to be sweat, it was difficult to breathe through once it got wet. Up until that, working at probably arguably an accelerated rate, even though a shorter period of time, it was relatively easy to breathe through. It, it was comfortable and it was able to live up to what our expectations were that we were communicating to our marketplace saying, yes, uh, can you breathe through it? Yes, does it have structural integrity? Yes, will it protect you in a short duration thermal event? So we were able to check all those boxes where we originally looked at and said, can we do this and can we do this to uh, all of these criteria? And the answer uh, at the end of the day for us uh, was yes. So as we get close to wrapping up here, what are some of the things to summarize in what to do when you're uh, required to wear clothing as PBE, when you're required to wear clothing that has protection against short duration thermal hazards like arc flash and flash fire, what are some things that you kind of need to think about in the back of your mind? Well, we summarize that up into four things. One big don't and three things that you can do uh, when you as an essential worker have to be in and around the coronavirus. The one big don't, and I'm sure you've heard this, but understand when we were first presenting this early on, don't share PPE. And if we haven't gotten to the point to where uh, we, everybody has their own kits, uh, we definitely need to the point to where everybody has their own hoods, helmets, balaclavas, uh, safety glasses, face shields, anything in and around that breathing zone uh, has to be a definite. Different surfaces need to be disinfected and sanitized differently. You have to have a, you have a lot of different surfaces in your uh, PPE from rubber, from leather, polycarbonates, uh, high density plastics. If you're having, and they, they, this equipment is not designed to be cleaned after every single use per se. When you look at an arc flash suit, it's not meant to have that hood torn apart or that helmet structure where that face shield is to be pulled apart and sanitized and cleaned and then reassembled on a per use basis. But if you are sharing your PPE, that's what you would have to do. Uh, so it's kind of, very, very difficult to disinfect this stuff in the field. Uh, arc flash kits for us are, are a huge concern, uh, but even, even sharing of helmets, like I said, safety glasses, hearing protection, uh, rubber gloves and leather protectors, we need to eliminate the sharing of PPE. And again, that's a huge cringe right now. Uh, that is a huge, cost item because some of these, uh, I used to have, you know, we'd have a crew of 40 guys. So we'd have two mediums, two larges, two extra larges and one two XL and that would cover the crew. That is probably having to go by the wayside. I mean, that practice, even though we're coming out the tail end of this, I'm sure there's folks right now who are communicating to their safety folks, communicating to their leadership group, communicating to those that we need to redirect funds so that we're not having to uh, share uh, our PPE. It's just not going to be uh, 
a safe practice going forward. Some things to do. Number one, handling your FR clothing in the COVID environment. If you are out in your uh, daily tasks doing whatever you need to do and you are pretty comfortable that there is no threat of contamination that I've come across or come in contact with, uh, I've been working my route, working my customers, doing whatever I'm doing and I'm very confident just follow the manufacturer's laundry guidelines, uh, whether you're doing that at home or if you're handing those off to an industrial launderer, uh, there's no additional needs for additives, sanitizer, bleaches, Lysols, uh, no need to isolate your clothing beyond what the manufacturer says. And that's simple things, wash them by themselves. Uh, Pre-COVID, you wouldn't be washing your uh, personal clothing in with your work clothing 99% of the time. Uh, anyway, so just continue that practice. There's no need for special handling. And if you recall earlier on, if 20 seconds of warm to hot water and soap is good enough for my hands, what's a half an hour in the laundry cycle and another half an hour in the dryer and that heat going to do to the virus? Number two, if you feel that you have a concern through contamination or exposure, the one big thing is, is when you're uh, doffing your clothing at the end of the day, don't shake it, don't spread it about, get it into your, uh, your washer as, as quickly and as uh, without touching anything else with it as reasonably possible. Uh, once you're done touching and you're out of that, get your hands either uh, with alcohol or better yet, just wash your hands. Take a note of any things that you may have touched from the in and out and make sure you're disinfecting those. So isolate your clothing, remove away from any living areas. What does that mean? You're probably stepping into the garage, ideally with the garage doors closed, getting out of your work gear, picking them up, getting them into the wash cycle, and then just retracing your steps and making sure that uh, everything is uh, cleaned after that. And follow the manufacturer's guidelines. Again, no special uh, additives such as sanitizer, bleach, or Lysols are necessary. And again, note the heat of the water, the agitation of the wash cycle, as well as the chemicals in the detergent work well to render this virus uh, inactive. And then we're gonna go throw it in a hot dryer for uh, 20 to 30 minutes also. So you should have very, very high level of confidence that you can take care of these, uh, your PPE at home. Handling your equipment and tools in the COVID world, we've talked briefly about, and we really talked about utilizing that diluted uh, bleach water disinfectant solution and what to be cautious of there. But wear disposable gloves uh, to clean and disinfect, clean surfaces using soap and water, then use disinfectant where you can and where it makes sense and where you're allowed. Uh, cleaning with soap and water reduces the number of germs, dirt, and impurities on the surface, and then disinfecting kills it on the surface. So you're, 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 you're getting it both ways. You're, you're reducing the number of germs because actual, the cleaning with soap and water removes them, and then disinfecting kills whatever is left and practice your routine cleaning and disinfecting from frequently retouched surfaces. And I know we've kind of revised some of these guidelines. And again, as we are slowly coming out of it, you're gonna see some of these guidelines uh, being moved back from the general public, but a lot of organizations and rightfully so are going to continue with these best practices as they see fit until really the all clear sounds at some time uh, in the near future going well. So proper care of your flame resistant cloth face covering. Wash all cloth face coverings before use. You should wash all your textiles before use. Wash hands and sanitize before donning. Start with a clean uh, canvas and don your face mask. Proper fit over the nose, under the chin, snug on the sides and then obviously avoid touching your face while wearing. 
removal and or donning. So taking it off and putting it back on. We wanna remove from the top down. You don't wanna remove from the bottom up because you're introducing it into your breathing zone. You want it falling away from your breathing zone. And then when you're donning it, you want to reverse that process. And obviously wash your hands and or sanitize between each use. Uh, leaving them on the rear view mirror, a lot of folks have ultraviolet light kills the virus. Not enough ultraviolet light gets through your windshield to kill the virus when it's hanging from your uh, rear view mirror. The only way ultraviolet light in that scenario would work is if you laid it across the uh, hood of your vehicle while you sat and ate lunch and exposed it that way. But it's not going to get it just hanging from the rear view mirror. So make sure you're cleaning them on a regular basis. Uh, make sure they're designed to be washed and worn. So don't have it just hanging there all week and do it once a week. Do that on a regular basis because that is what you're breathing through. Don't share PPE, hard hats, face shields, arc flash suits, hoods, et cetera. Sanitize PPE by laundering uh, when possible. Wear your FRAR cloth face coverings. Do not replace or substitute for your proper PPE, AKA don't stop wearing your face shield. Don't stop wearing your balaclavas. Don't stop wearing your hoods because you have a FR cloth face covering on there. Take care of your PPE so it can take care of you. A lot of great resources on the marketplace. A lot of the top manufacturers today have uh, COVID links in and around their websites. All of them are, are really good, providing a, a lot of good up-to-date information. Uh, this just happens to be a sample of ours. Uh, that's my contact information. Uh, feel free to get a hold of me anytime. Hopefully this reinforced a lot of stuff that you're doing maybe got you a gold nugget that you can take back to your team uh, and talk to them about. Uh, so with that, I know uh, we'll get back to Barry here for Q&A. And as he said, if we don't get everything today or you give me something, as again, I'm not a medical guy, if you give me something where you need a more detailed, thorough explanation that I can provide, we'll definitely either get you those resources or get you in touch with these resources. So with that, Barry, back to you. Great, thank you so much, Derek. We truly appreciate you sharing your expertise with us today. Just a reminder for all of our audience members that if you'd like to ask a question, uh, click on that Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, type in your question and press the send button. Uh, before we start the Q&A, I wanna let everyone know about an evaluation survey we're asking you to complete. The survey will open in a different screen after this webinar. And your input is really important to us because it does help us to improve our future webcasts. And with that, we're gonna start with some questions here. So Derek, first of all, Robert from our audience uh, has a question, then an example for you. Uh, he wants to know, are there any respirators that can be worn within the minimum approach distance to high voltage electrical hazards? And he says he's seen N95 respirators on the market that state they're flame resistant, uh, but they're not arc rated. Is there a solution such as wearing an FR N95 underneath an arc rated face shield? That is a good question. And uh, to be honest with you, in the, in the 14, 15 months we've been going through this, I have not had it asked to me in that detail. Uh, I'm going to get back uh, on this one. Uh, only because I don't want to misspeak and say, yes, do this and do this when you don't have to. Uh, I will reach out to my buddy, Hugh Hoagland, who's done some work with N95s uh, prior to this. I think even during the original uh, SARS outbreak, there was some work done. Uh, so let me reach out, find out where he is up to date and what his recommendation would be before I go and try to uh, answer that off the cuff. So I'll de defer that one to, but I will follow up with, that's a really good question. Okay, sounds good. And Robert, we thank you for the question. As Derek said, he will um, get in touch with his colleagues and get you an answer here. Um, Christopher from our audience has a couple questions for you, Derek. First of all, he asks, uh, is there a white paper or research for the bleach verification uh, test that you, that you mentioned? 
I will uh, I will get Christopher uh, Scott Margolin at Tyndale did a lot of the work uh, that I spoke to here, uh, and I do know they have resources on their website at Tyndale USA, uh, and I'll reach out to Scott and get back with uh, Christopher uh, for more detail on that. Okay, sounds good. And Christopher has a second question for us today. Um, Derek, he asks, does the vertical flame test meet the ASTM standard uh, F1506? So the vertical flame test is uh, the first real test that we do before anything uh, goes on to be called FR and then ultimately AR. So within 1506, you have to pass uh, 6413, which is the vertical flame test, first and foremost. So anything at the end of the day that has uh, ASTM 2733, for example, in rainware for flash fire and 1891 for arc flash and 1506, uh, anything like that, the very it's going to have 6413 somewhere in its criteria in order to meet whatever that standard is. So it's kind of like the baseline uh, to verify that the FR engineering is indeed there. So roundabout way of saying yes. Okay, great, thank you for that. Uh, James from our audience has our next question. And James is curious, is there any information on clothing adjustment factors for face coverings for heat stress scenarios? Ooh. Good question, because uh, we do have, and when we look at clothing adjustment factors for single layer clothing, whether it's FR or non-FR, uh, the adjustment factor is zero. And uh, where you have to uh, actually get to something where there's an adjustment is when you have anything that's a type of barrier. So let's say, as we were talking about putting on a disposable FR coverall because I didn't want to get paint, hydraulic fluid, or whatever I was cleaning with on my very expensive uh, shirts, pants, and coveralls. Now I've introduced a barrier and I'm no longer a single layer non-FR or FR uh, garment, and I would have a clothing adjustment factor. I don't believe anyone has gotten to, to where they are looking at uh, that in cloth base coverings. Uh, I wouldn't even know where to look and see if anyone has taken up the challenge uh, for that. My gut feeling is, is there is a delay in general in the hope that masks will go away. And if masks are going to stay, there's probably some folks who need to pick up that charge and go and find out. Uh, but I haven't seen anything to date, or do I know of anyone taking that on to see if there is uh, an effect in, in heat stress in general? Now, obviously, we talk about rest, shade, and hydration, uh, and that would factor across. Now, are we getting, are we accelerating to where heat stress comes into play because I'm potentially interfering with my respiratory rate? Everything that I have seen that talks to respiration, as far as what is your, uh, you know, oxygen saturation, uh, all, everything that I've seen shows little or no effect as long as you can breathe through that fabric and the most common fabric people are talking about is double layer, uh, you know, twill cotton, which is the majority of even non FR stuff out there. And some of them arguably even have greater filtration, which unfortunately though means that it's not doing a whole heck of a lot because we have no parameters as far as what we can cut and sew these masks out of. But at least in the FR world, we're utilizing fabrics that we know are our single layer shirts currently today. So I don't know how to find out what you're asking. I don't know of anybody that's doing it. And I don't know what 
putting up something across my breathing zone that does not knock down or make it harder for me to breathe would factor into heat stress, though we do know respiration is something that needs to be monitored. Uh, but I think that would be across all face coverings, not just FR face coverings. And I don't know anybody that's currently doing the work. And if anybody out there does, please notify me because this is important. And if someone is doing this kind of work, we would definitely want to see where it's going uh, because it, we responded to something. And when I say we, I'm talking about a marketplace responded to their customers' needs with the best information they had available at the time to get them something because they had to keep working and we couldn't, it was a greater hazard to have them have something that would ignite, melt or drip. So we took something that's been close to the breathing zone for eons, as I said, we have folks that are cutting and sewing this with no respiratory uh, protection needed. This is our best offering, but if there's better information that can help us produce a better mousetrap, I would sure like to know about it. But to answer your question directly, I don't know of anyone doing that work. Great, thank you for that, Derek. And for folks out there, if you do know of something along those lines, Derek's email is on the screen currently. Um, so feel free to shoot him an email. Um, I'd definitely like to converse with you about that topic. Uh, Derek, we've got time for one more. And I wanted to ask you from Mike in our audience, uh, wants to know if I'm wearing a hard hat with a face shield, do I still need a mask or, or a cloth face covering? Uh, good. Glad you asked that question, Mike, because if you were working alone, because, okay, what? why are we wearing a cloth face covering? Because we're either in close proximity, we're less than six feet from a coworker, and we want to knock down the water droplets and we want to not inhale as many water droplets as we could have. So we've put up this cloth face covering across our breathing zone. If I am an electrician and I am going into the arc flash boundary and I have my hard hat face shield balaclava, well, first and foremost, my balaclava most balaclavas can be pulled up to the nose. So I would, I personally would discontinue the use of my cloth face covering at that time once I don my balaclava. The second thing I would do is once I created my own breathing environment, AKA just dropping that face shield, that face shield now is going to not as well as a cloth face covering, but if I had my balaclava across my mouth, and my nose, and I drop my face shield, and I have no one within six feet of me, do I really need a cloth face covering? Well, if your company says you must wear it, then that's a discussion with them. But I think we could reasonably discuss that under those finite conditions that I just gave you to where I'm working by myself, there's no one within six feet, I've got a balaclava on and I'm dropping my face shield, do I need a cloth face covering? I think we could make a reasonable to say you probably don't. Uh, similar to if I was in a 40 cal fast suit or higher and I'm going into switching gear or if I'm racking a breaker and I don my arc flash uh, hood, do I need to be wearing a face uh, cloth face covering? I would argue the same that I just argued with the face shield and say no. Uh, now, are you? can you make the argument that if I'm wearing my cloth face mask, I can share the, the hood? Absolutely not. So the cloth face covering can be removed at that time. I'm donning the hood. The hood in and of itself is doing what the cloth face covering would be. And there's no one within six feet of me. I would say I am following guidelines. Uh, now, each company would probably is, is free to interpret that as they see fit, but to if you and I were sitting around having that conversation, that would be my answer. I have, I am doing as much with the cloth face covering without it if I've got my balaclava on and I've dropped my face shield and there's no one within six feet of me, I would say you're free to take the cloth face covering off. Great. Well, thank you for that, Derek. I truly appreciate all the insights you shared with us today. 
Unfortunately, folks, we have run out of time. I'm sorry we did not get to everyone's questions, uh, but all the unanswered questions will be forwarded along to Derek today. Uh, again, we also hope you take the time to uh, share your feedback via our survey. And I'd like to thank our outstanding presenter, Derek Sang, everyone from our sponsor over at Bulwark, and of course, all of you who joined us today. This ends today's Safety and Health Magazine webcast. Take care, everyone, and have a safe day.